Sometimes I can't believe I get to do what I get to do. Driving here this morning, I thought, can you believe you get to think and talk and read and write about all these wonderful ideas of God, heaven, love, forgiveness, the return of Christ, my favorite, grace. We start a new series this weekend entitled, What Happens When Grace Happens. Last fall, as Randy took us through the study of the book of Romans, so clearly explaining the redemption plan of God for his people, he whetted our appetites to understand more of of how God gives grace. So we thought it wise to return to this sequoia of truth and stand beneath the shades of these great trees, the trees of grace. I invite you to be a part of each and every weekend between now and Easter as we look at grace from every possible angle. Maybe grace is a long-time friend of yours so we've even got some new things to discuss. But maybe you don't know about grace. If so, uh, you're at the right place. Each weekend as we begin the message, we'll begin with a prayer. And I'd invite you to offer this prayer with me as you read it on the screen. Let's pray together. Dear God of all grace, please grant us the grace to receive your grace. And grant us the grace to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. Not one of the workers requested a shovel. Not one of them wanted a sharper pick. Headlamps, excavation maps, hammers, no one wanted a single tool. Not one of the workers was asking for somebody to help them dig their way out, but every single worker was excited about the thought of somebody coming from the outside to pull them out and who could blame them these 33 miners in Chile were 2,000 feet beneath the surface trapped in a mine 2,000 feet for two months they were trapped Many days they survived on a spoonful of tuna, small dose of peaches, and a sip of milk. They did their best to keep each other encouraged. They even exercised. They carved out a natural water deposit. And they spent their time at the very place where they hoped the rescuers would find them. Meanwhile, 2,000 feet above them, rescuers were busy devising a rescue plan, consulting NASA, calling in experts. The Chilean government was determined to rescue the men. They created, if you remember, a 13-foot tall rescue capsule, and they drilled two holes, first one for communication, then the second for excavation, for rescue. But they had no guarantee that they would successfully retrieve the men. No men had ever been so far beneath the surface for so long and lived to tell about it. But now they have. Because on October the 13th, 2010, one by one, the miners began to emerge. Florencia Avalo exited first. His young son hugged him so did the Chilean president 40 year old Mario Sepulveda was second you may remember he's the one who burst out of the capsule giving high fives and and leading victory chants then came a great grandfather a 44 year old who was planning a church wedding soon followed then a 19 year old Each rescue was a victory, and each victory was a story, like the story of Yanni Barrios. Two women were waiting on him to come out. (laughs) 
The first was his wife of 31 years. The second was his mistress. The first did not know about the second. Maybe that's why he was one of the last to come out. <laughs> Number 24 was Jose Enriquez. He was the man who had requested the 33 Bibles be lowered into the cavern because he was hosting a daily Bible study. My hunch is attendance was very high. <laughs> After all, when you're trapped half a mile underground, you need all the help you can get. And they all accepted it. No one returned the offer of rescue with a declaration of muscle. No one sent the message up to the rescuers saying, I'm just about to get out of here on my own. Nobody said, just give me another day or two. I'll dig my way out of this mess. Nobody tried to save themselves. In fact, they unanimously reached the conclusion, you know what? We need help. We need somebody from up there to come into our world down here and pull us out. And maybe you've reached that conclusion It's not that this world is that bad. It's just that somewhere along the line, we realize we were not made for this world. Even though it has its moments, it's still what it is, a dark place, cavernous. You can paint the walls as often as you want, as brightly as you can, but somehow, don't you know, down deep, somehow you know you're cut off from the source of light. That you were not made to live in a world that is marred by death and decay and cancer and corruption. So how do you get out of it? That's the question. And God's answer is a word that every person cherishes. What's that word? I bet you know. It's grace. To hear us, you'd think we understood the word. We talk about how the teacher gives the students a grace period. How the politician falls from grace. How the dancer is graceful. Or the hostess is gracious. We use the word grace to name hospitals and baby girls. We even talk about grace as something we say before we eat. But certainly there must be more. Certainly there must be more to grace than elegance in religious rituals. And if you think there is not anything more to grace than what you say before you eat, oh boy, are you in for a surprise. In fact, we might start with one of the sweetest surprises of all, and that is when the word grace first appeared in the Bible. This is on your outline if you'd like to follow. I've been having fun lately asking people if they know when the word grace first appeared in the Bible, receiving a variety of answers. Most people think it probably appeared first because of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Nobody wrote about grace more than Paul, but he was not the first to write about grace. Others have suggested, well, it must be the teachings of Jesus. Well, nobody lived grace more than our master did. But he was not the first to mention grace. King David, someone suggested. You know, King David relied upon the grace of God. But he wasn't the first to mention the grace of God. Others look at me when I ask the question like I'm asking a stupid question. Like, who cares? Does it really matter? I think it does. I think that good Bible study is a bit like good archaeology. You learn more the deeper you dig. And you learn more the farther back you go. You understand a culture by discovering its beginnings. And you understand a doctrine or a truth by going back to its beginning. So where is the beginning of grace? When does the word grace first appear in the Bible? Well, you won't be surprised when I say, in the book of beginnings, 
the book of Genesis. Open your Bibles to chapter 6. And there you'll see it in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. Yes, Noah, the ark building, flood surviving, animal herding, dove sending, rainbow discovering, wine drinking, Noah. The word grace first appears in the Bible when his name does. Now why is that important? Well, I believe it's important because the word grace follows some of the most difficult words in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 6, now in verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at the words here. Feel their force wickedness was great every intent was only evil continually now we're tempted to dismiss this as hyperbole or, or exaggeration but then we remember in our own recent history the skeletons of Auschwitz or the the skulls of the Cambodian killing fields or the bodies of the Tutsis and Rwanda and we realize it is possible for a society to sink to the point where every thought every intent is only evil continually yes it does happen and it happened in the days of Noah but how how did such evil happen and how did it happen so fast why it was just six chapters ago in Genesis chapter 1, we were reading about the perfect creation of mankind. Remember Genesis chapter 1 is where we have that stanza that's repeated six times. That, that rhythm, that rhythm of it. And God said, and so it was, and it is good. And God said, and so it was, and it is good. And God said, and so it was, and it is good. Six different times he said that. And God said, let there be light. And so it was, and it is good. Let there be land. Let there be sea. Let there be animals. It is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. It was good. It was good. And then the magnum opus, the greatest creation of all. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed this couple. And he told them to have babies, to have dominion, to help each other, and to help themselves to a good life. And how could they do anything but? Their work was their play, and their animals were their friends. Funerals were unknown. Lions loved the lambs and the skunks didn't stink and the earth didn't shake and the sky didn't roar. It was a, it was a perfect, glistening paradise. They wore no shoes because there were no thorns. They wore no clothing because there was nothing to hide. There was honesty, there was openness, there was acceptance. They had each other. Man and woman, or in Hebrew, ish and isha. They shared not only the same creator, they shared the same name. Different expressions of the same God. Reciprocal, mutual, separate, equal. He had her, she had him, and they both had God. God! who tended to show up in the cool of the evening just to take a stroll around the lake. And Adam and Eve would get the impression would walk with him. There was a sweetness. There was a perfectness. And God, who would see his hand-in-hand -hand children, he couldn't resist declaring, oh, how special this was. 
God saw everything he had made and indeed it was what's the word very good six times he said it was good but when he saw it all together he said now this this is very good and when God says something is very good we know it is very good these were very good days but into this world of no fear and into this world of all joy there slithered a servant of evil has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The question that he gave to Eve was such a subtle one. He deposited within her heart the seed of distrust. Not the seed of anger, not the seed of rebellion that would follow, but the first seed that gave rise to the others is the seed of distrust. What if God is holding back on you, Eve? What if he has something more, Eve? What if there's something better, Eve? Has God really said you cannot eat? What if he, is he hold, what? And for the first time, Eve distrusted. She grew suspicious of God. And she decided that her plan was better than his plan. In order for her to reach the forbidden fruit, she had to release the hand of her father, and so she did. And when she did, that was Satan's cue to invite all of his minions into the garden, and they did not have to be asked twice. They came scampering in, and for the first time, fear came into the garden. Pride came into the garden. Shame came into the garden. Fear drove them into hiding. Pride caused Adam to blame Eve. Shame caused them to cover themselves in fig leaves and cheap excuses and lame explanations. And as fast as you can say chaos, paradise became exactly that. Their firstborn killed their secondborn. One of their descendants decided that one wife wasn't enough. He had to have more. Blood splattered all over their family tree as relatives fought relatives and nations fought nations. And by the time we reach Genesis chapter 6, they have descended into a pit that is not 2,000 feet of hard rock, but is seven generations of hard hearts. And no one's talking about Eden anymore. And when God saw what happened... He had enough. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now picking up again in Genesis 6, this time in verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. God who sees not just the actions of man. But sees the intent of man. Saw that the intent of man was nothing but evil. And would bring only evil. Decided it would be best just to bring an end to it all. No one was craving a closeness with God. Not one person was grieving the fall or longing for the garden. Nobody was remembering how God intended for them to live. Nobody except Noah. Noah. He just pops up in the Bible. He just appears. This is the first reference we have not just to grace, but it's the first reference we have to Noah. He just shows up. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I really wish I could tell you more about Noah. How this descendant of Adam came to be good in a world gone bad. How this butterfly landed in the pigsty. 
I wish I could tell you what he did to find grace. Was he benevolent? Was he radical? Was he educated? Was he illuminated? Did he sleep on coals? Did he, did he wear sandals? Did, did, did he never eat? Did he eat all the time? Did he graduate summa cum laude? I don't know. We don't know what Noah did. Did he pray? Did he fast? Did he pray fast? We just aren't told. If only Noah had told us. If only he had written a book. How I found grace when no one else did. Twelve easy steps to God's grace. If he had just told us. But he didn't leave us anything. No resume. No diplomas. Here's if you want to fill in the blank. What do we know about Noah? Nada. <laughs> Nada. We don't know what he did. Now listen. Let me be clear. We know what Noah did after he found grace. He built a boat. He saved the animals. Well, he saved the human race. He became a preacher. He became a faith walker. He became a man of God whose faith was recorded in the New Testament book of Hebrews. But what he did before he found grace, we simply are not told. In fact, the reason we call him Noah is because we don't know a thing about him. <laughs> I thought that was clever. All we know of is that he trusted God. And when God lowered a rescue capsule into his world, he climbed in. Isn't this interesting? That the flagship reference to grace in the whole Bible gives us no instructions on how to get it. Now that's frustrating. No, that's illuminating. You see, the, the appearance of grace in Grace 101, day number one, brings this announcement. The grace is not up to the one who receives it. The grace is up to the one who gives it. And the big message of grace is not what we do, but what God does. And the grace does not depend upon the pedigree or the accomplishments of the Noahs. For God knew if we saw his accomplishments, we'd all try to imitate them so we could receive grace, right? But maybe the reason he emerges out of the fog is so the emphasis will not be on him, but upon God. Noah found grace. Noah did not find a reward for the work that he did. Noah did not find recognition for the accomplishments of his life. Noah did not find an ability within himself. He did not find the capacity to stand up and reach God. No, he found a God who would stoop down and reach him. The Hebrew word for grace comes from this very same word that the Hebrews used for the word stoop. It comes from the same family as the word stoop. Isn't that interesting? Grace is is the God who stoops, who bends, who reaches down, who condescends, who extends his hand into a dark world and pulls us up. Noah found grace because God found Noah. Period. Noah found grace before he pounded a nail. Noah found grace before he loaded an animal. Noah found grace before he swabbed a deck. Noah found grace before he opened an umbrella. Noah did not find grace because he worked. Noah found grace because God did. And if you've ever grown weary of working your way to God, friends, that is good news. Could you use this kind of grace? Could you use the kind of grace that depends not upon the goodness of the receiver, but the goodness of the giver? 
Could you use the kind of grace that does not depend upon the perfection of the person, but the faithfulness of God? Could you use the kind of grace that says, no matter how dark the world gets, wherever God finds a flicker of faith, he responds with a gift of grace. Could you use that kind of grace? Well, oh, most of us could. I know I could. I believe you and I agree that this world is not paradise. That the world we read about in Genesis chapter 1 is not the world in which we find ourselves. We find a world of fighting, of harmony, of disunity, of disease and death. And no matter how many times we paint or decorate the walls of this cavern, it just doesn't feel right. We know there is a better world than this one. However, everybody keeps telling us, if you dig, you'll get out. If you dig a little more, the preacher the priest, the rabbi, the teacher, the parent, the therapist. The message comes in different words, but it's essentially the same. Dig. Be better. Behave. Be good. Be right. Be long. They come like the killer bees. Be this. Be that. But in the midst of all of these instructions on how to fix yourself comes this message of grace. Be still. Be quiet. Believe. Could it be this simple? It was for the Chilean miners. The only instructions they were given upon their rescue was step in and you'll be pulled out so they took a step of faith and something wonderful happened I believe that God gives you and me the same invitation sometimes that invitation falls on deaf ears because we think this cavern is what life is all about but then that, cat, that invitation falls on hungry ears because we're weary of this world, cut off from the source of light. And deep within, we're ready. <laughs> we're ready. But we just don't know how. And the big announcement, at least the first announcement about grace, is that God is taking responsibility for pulling us out. And that something wonderful happens when we let Him take over. Over the next few weeks, let's just see what happens when grace happens. Maybe you have some questions about grace. Questions like, well, does grace mean I can just do whatever I want and God is going to forgive me? We're going to talk about that. Questions like, well, somebody's got to pay for our sin, right? Right. Right. And I'm going to make sure you know who did. Or questions like, well, you don't know the mess I've made of my life. You don't know the mistakes I've made. You don't know how hard my heart has been. Does God have grace for someone like me? And if that's your question, boy, are you in the right place. Because what God wants to give you what he gave through Jesus Christ. Out of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. John chapter 1 and verse 16. Could you use grace upon grace? And something wonderful happens when you receive grace upon grace. We saw this when the Chilean miners were rescued. As they stepped out of their capsule, I noticed that they, to a person, said the same word over and over again. 
to the president, to the rescue team, to the authorities, to their families. They said the same word over and over again. You know what that word was? Gracias. 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 And what is gracias except grasa? And what is grasa except the grace? The grace that reaches into our dark world and pulls us out. Now you find that grace.